A Streetcar Named Desire by Tennessee Williams. Scene 7. It is late afternoon in mid-September. The portiers are open and a table is set for a birthday supper with cake and flowers. Stella is completing the decorations as Stanley comes in. What's all this stuff for? Hey, it's Blanche's birthday. Is she here? In the bathroom. Hmm. Washing out some things? I reckon so. How long has she been in there? All afternoon. Soaking in a hot tub. Yes. Temperature 100 on the nose and she soaks herself in a hot tub. She says it cools her off for the evening. Mm. And you run out and get her cokes, I suppose. And serve them to her majesty in the tub? Sit down here a minute. Stanley, I've got things to do. Sit down. I've got the dope on your big sister, Stella. Stanley, stop picking on Blanche. That girl called me common. Lately, you've been doing all you can think of to rub her the wrong way, Stanley, and Blanche is sensitive. And you've got to realize that Blanche and I grew up under very different circumstances than you did. So I've been told, and told, and told, and told. You know, she's feeding us a pack of lies here? No, I don't, and- Well, she has, however. But now the cat's out of the bag, I found out some things. What things? Things I already suspected, but now I got proof from the most reliable sources, which I've checked on. Blanche is singing in the bathroom, a saccharine popular ballad, which is used contrapunctually with Stanley's speech. What were your voice? Some canary bird, huh? Now, please tell me quietly what you think you found out about my sister. Line number one. All this squeamishness she puts on. You should just know the line she's been feeding to Mitch. He thought she had never been more than kissed by a fellow, but Sister Blanche is no lily. <laughs> Some lily she is. What have you heard and from who? Our supply man down at the plant has been going through Laurel for years, and he knows all about her. And everyone else in the Toronto Laurel knows all about her. She's as famous in Laurel as if she were the President of the United States, only she's not respected by any party. The supply man stops at a hotel called the Flamingo. Hey, it's only a paper moon. Sailing over a cardboard sea, but it wouldn't be make believe if you believed in me. What about the flamingo? She stayed there too. My sister lived at Bell Reeve. This is after the home place had slipped through her lily white fingers. She moved to the Flamingo, a second class hotel which has the advantage of not interfering in the private social life of the personalities there. The flamingo's used to all kinds of goings on. Even the management of the Flamingo was impressed by Dame Blanche. In fact, they were so impressed by Dame Blanche that they requested her to turn in her room key for permanently. This happened a couple of weeks before she showed here. It's a Barnum and Bailey world, just as funny as it can be. But it wouldn't be make-believe if you believed in me. What contemptible lies! I can see how you'd be upset by this. She pulled the wool over your eyes as much as Mitch's. It's pure invention. There's not a word of truth in it. And if I were a man and this creature had dared to invent such things in my presence? Without your love, it's a honky-tonk parade. Without your love, it's a melody played in a penny arcade. Honey, I told you, I thoroughly checked on these stories. And wait till I finish. The trouble with Dame Blanche was that she couldn't put on her act anymore in Laurel. They got wised up after two or three dates with her and then they quit. She goes on to another. Same old line, same old act, same old hooey. The town was too small for this to go on forever. And as time went by, she became a town character, regarded as not just different, but downright local nuts. Stella draws back. And for the last year or two, she has been washed up like poison. That's why she's here this summer, visiting royalty, putting on this act, because she's basically told the mayor to get out of town. Did you know that there was an army camp near Laurel and your sister's was one of the places called Out of Bounds? It's only a paper moon, just as funny as it can be. But it wouldn't be make-believe if you believed in me. 
Well, so much for being such a refined and particular type of girl, which brings us to line number two. I don't want to hear anymore. She's not going back to teach school. In fact, I'm willing to bet you she has never had no idea of returning to Laurel. She didn't resign temporarily from the high school because of her nerves. No, sir, Reed, Bob, she didn't. They locked her out of that high school before the spring term ended. And I hate to tell you the reason that step was taken. A 17-year-old boy she'd gotten mixed up with. It's a Barnum and Bailey world, just as phony as it can be. In the bathroom, the water goes on loud, little breathless cries and peals of laughter are heard as if a child were frolicking in the tub. <laughs> this is making me sick. Boy's dad learned about it and got in touch with the high school and superintendent. Boy, oh boy, I'd like to have been in that office when Dame Blanche was called on the carpet. I'd like to have seen her trying to squirm out of that one. But they had her on the hook good and proper that time, and she knew the jig was up. They told her she better move on to some fresh territory. It was practically a town ordinance passed against her. The bathroom door is opened, and Blanche thrusts her head out, holding a towel about her hair. Stella! Yes, Blanche? Give me another bath towel to dry my hair with. I've just washed it. Yes, Blanche. She crosses in a dazed way from the kitchen to the bathroom door with the towel. What's the matter, honey? Matter? Why? You have such a strange expression on your face. Oh, I, I guess I'm a little tired. Well, why don't you bathe too, as soon as I get out? How soon is that going to be? Not so terribly long. Possess your soul in patience. It's not my soul, it's my kidneys I'm worried about. Blanche slams the door. Stanley laughs harshly. Stella comes slowly back into the kitchen. Well, what do you think of it? I don't believe all of those stories, and I think your supply man was mean and rotten to tell them. It's possible that some of the things he said are partly true. There are things about my sister I don't approve of, things that cause sorrow at home. She was always flighty. Flighty? But when she was young, very young, she married a boy who wrote poetry. He was extremely good looking. I think Blanche didn't just love him, but worshiped the ground he walked on, adored him and thought him almost too fine to be human. But then she found out- What? This beautiful and talented young man was a degenerate. Didn't your supply man give you that little piece of information? All we discussed was recent history. It must have been a pretty long time ago. Yes, it was a pretty long time ago. Stanley comes up and takes her by the shoulders rather gently. She withdraws from him. Automatically, she starts sticking little pink candles in the birthday cake. How many candles you put in that cake? I'll stop at 25. Is company expected? We asked Mitch to come over for cake and ice cream. Stanley looks a little uncomfortable. He lights a cigarette from the one he has just finished. I wouldn't be expecting Mitch over tonight. Stella pauses in her occupation with candles and looks slowly around at Stanley. Why? Mitch is a buddy of mine. We were in the same outfit together. Two 41st engineers. We work in the same plant, now we're on the same bowling team. You think I could face him? Stanley Kowalski? Did you, did you repeat what that? You goddamn right, I told him. I'd have that on my conscience for the rest of my life if I knew all that stuff and let my best friend get caught. Is Mitch through with her? Wouldn't you be if, if... I said, is Mitch through with her? Blanche's voice is lifted again, serenely as a bell. But I wouldn't be make-believe if you believed in me. No, I don't think he's necessarily through with her, but he's just wised up. Stanley, she thought Mitch was going to... going to marry her. I was hoping so, too. Well, he's not going to marry her. Well, maybe he was, but he's not going to jump in a tank with a school of sharks now. He rises. Blanche. Oh, Blanche, can I please get in my bathroom? There is a pause. Yes, indeed, sir. Can you wait one second while I dry? Having waited one hour, I guess one second ought to pass in a hurry. And she hasn't got her job. Well, what is she going to do? She's not staying here after Tuesday. You know that, don't you? Just to make sure I bought her a ticket myself, a bus ticket. 
In the first place, Blanche wouldn't go on a bus. She'll go on a bus and like it. No, she won't. No, she won't, Stanley. She'll go, period. P.S. She'll go Tuesday. What? What'll she do? What on earth will she do? Her future is mapped out for her. What do you mean? Blanche sings. Hey. Hey, canary bird. Toots, get out of the bathroom. The bathroom door flies open and Blanche emerges with a gay peal of laughter. As Stanley crosses past her, a frightened look appears on her face, almost a look of panic. He doesn't look at her, but slams the bathroom door shut as he goes in. Blanche snatches up a hairbrush. Oh, I feel so good after my long, hot bath. I feel so good and cool and rested. Do you, Blanche? Oh, yes, I do. I feel so refreshed. She tinkles her highball glass. A hot bath and a long, cool drink always give me a brand new outlook on life. She looks through the portiers at Stella, standing between them, and slowly stops brushing. Something's happened. What is it? Why, nothing has happened, Blanche. You're lying. Something has. She stares fearfully at Stella, who pretends to be busy at the table. The distant piano goes into a hectic breakdown. Scene eight. Three quarters of an hour later, the view through the big windows is fading gradually into a still golden dusk. A torch of sunlight blazes on the side of a big water tank or oil drum across the empty lot towards the business district, which is now pierced by pinpoints of lighted windows or windows reflecting the sunset. The three people are completing a dismal birthday supper. Stanley looks sullen. Stella is embarrassed and sad. Blanche has a tight artificial smile on her drawn face. There is a fourth place at the table, which is left vacant. Stanley, tell us a joke. Tell us a, a funny little story to make us all laugh. I don't know what's the matter. We're all so solemn because, is it because I've been stood up by my bow? Stella laughs feebly. It is the first time in my entire experience with men, and I've had a good deal of all sorts, that I've actually been stood up by anybody. I, I don't know how to take it. Oh, tell us, uh, tell us a funny little story, Stanley. Something to help us out. Didn't think you liked my stories, Blanche. I like them when they're amusing, but not indecent. I don't know anything refined enough for your taste. Then let me tell one. Yes, you tell one, Blanche. You know a lot of good stories. The music fades. Let me see now. I must, I must run through my repertoire. Oh, oh yes, I love these parrot stories. Do you all like parrot stories? Well, this one is about the old maid and the parrot. This old maid, she had a parrot that cursed a blue streak and knew more vulgar expressions than, than Mr. Kowalski. <laughs> uh -huh. And the only way to hush the parrot up was to cover its back on its cage so it would think it was night and go back to sleep. Well, one morning, the old maid had just uncovered the parrot for the day when who should she see coming up the front walk but the preacher? <laughs> well, she rushed back to the parrot and slipped the cover back over the cage and then she let in the preacher. And the parrot was perfectly still, just as quiet as a mouse, but as she was asking the preacher how much sugar he wanted in his coffee, the parrot broke the silence with a loud, God damn, but that was a short day. <laughs> she throws back her head and laughs. Stella also makes an ineffectual effort to seem amused. Stanley pays no attention to the story, but reaches way over the table to spear his fork into the remaining chop, which he eats with his fingers. Apparently, Mr. Kowalski was not amused. Mr. Kowalski is too busy making a pig of himself to think of anything else. That's right, baby. Your face and your fingers are disgustingly greasy. Go and wash up and then help me clear the table. He hurls a plate to the floor. That's all clear table. He seizes her arm. Don't you ever talk that way to me. Pig, pollock, disgusting, vulgar, greasy. No kind of words have been on your tongue and your sister's too much around here. Well, what do you think you two are, huh? A pair of queens? Remember what Huey Long said, every man is a king. And I'm the king around here, so don't forget it. He hurls a cup and saucer to the floor. My place is clear. You want me to clear your places? Stella begins to cry weakly. Stanley stalks out on the porch and lights a cigarette. 
entertainers around the corner are heard. What happened while I was bathing? What did he tell you, Stella? Nothing, nothing, nothing. I think he told you something about Mitch and me. You know why Mitch didn't come, but you won't tell me. Stella shakes her head helplessly. I I'm gonna call him. I wouldn't call him, Blanche. I am, I'm gonna call him on the phone. I wish you wouldn't. I intend to be given some explanation from someone. She rushes to the phone in the bedroom. Stella goes out on the porch and stares reproachfully at her husband. He grunts and turns away from her. I hope you're pleased with your doings. I never had so much trouble swallowing food in my life. Looking at that girl's face in the empty chair? She cries quietly. Hello, uh, Mitchell, please. Oh, I would like to leave a number if I may. Magnolia 9047, and it's important to, it's important to call. Yes, very important. Thank you. She remains by the phone with a lost, frightened look. Stanley turns slowly back to his wife and takes her clumsily in his arms. So it's gonna be all right after she goes and you've had the baby. It's gonna be all right again between you and me, the way it was. You remember the way it was? The nights we had together? Honey, it's gonna be sweet when we can make noise in the night the way that we used to. Get the colored lights going with the nobody sister behind the curtains to hear us. The upstairs neighbors are heard bellowing in laughter at something. Stanley chuckles. Steven Yunus. Come on back in. She returns to the kitchen and starts lighting the candles on the white cake. Blanche? Yes. She returns from the bedroom to the table in the kitchen. Oh, those pretty little candles. Oh, don't burn them, Stella. I certainly will. Oh, Stanley you gotta save them. Back in. Oh, you gotta save them for the baby's birthday. Oh, I hope the candles are gonna glow in his life and that his eyes are gonna be like candles, like two blue candles and a lighted white cake. What poetry? I, sh I shouldn't have called him. There's lots of things that could have happened. There's no excuse for it, Stella. I shouldn't have to put up with insults. I won't be taken for granted. Damn, it's hot in here with the steam from the bathroom. I said I was sorry three times. The piano fades out. I take hot baths for my nerves. Hydrotherapy, they call it. You healthy Polak, without a nerve in your body. Of course you don't know what anxiety feels like. I'm not a Polak. People from Poland are Poles, not Polacks. But what I am is 100% American, born and raised in the greatest country on earth and proud as hell of it. So don't ever call me Polak. The phone rings. Blanche rises expectantly. Oh, that's for me, I'm sure. I'm not sure. Keep your seat. He crosses leisurely to the phone. Oh, hello. Ah, yeah, hello, Matt. He leans against the wall, staring insultingly in at Blanche. She sinks back into her chair with a frightened look. Stella leans over and touches her shoulder. Oh, keep your hands on me, Stella. What's the matter with you? Why do you look at me with that pity and look? Quiet in there. We got a noisy woman on the place. Go on, Matt. The Riley's? No, no, I don't want to bullet at Riley's. Had a little trouble with Riley last week. I'm the team captain, ain't I? All right. All right, then. We're not going to bullet at Riley's. We're going to bullet at the West Side or at the Gala, all right? All right, Max, see you soon. He hangs up and returns to the table. Blanche fiercely controls herself, drinking quickly from her tumbler of water. He doesn't look at her, but reaches in a pocket, then speaks slowly and with false amiability. Sister Blanche, got a little birthday remembrance for you. Well, have you, Stanley? I wasn't expecting any. I don't know why Stella wants to observe my birthday. I'd, I'd much rather forgive it, but, but when you reach 27, well, Age is a subject that you prefer to ignore. <laughs> 27? Oh, what is it for me? He's holding a little envelope towards her. Yeah, I hope you like it. Why? Why? Why, it's a... A ticket back to Laurel on the Greyhound Tuesday. The Vasuviana music steals in softly and continues playing. Stella rises abruptly and turns her back. Blanche tries to smile, then she tries to laugh. Then she gives up both and springs from the table and runs into the next room. She clutches her throat and runs into the bathroom. Coughing, gagging sounds are heard. Well, 
You didn't need to do that. Don't forget all that I took off her. You needn't have been so cruel to someone as alone as she is. Delicate piece she is. She is. She was. You didn't know Blanche as a girl. Nobody, nobody was as tender and as trusting as she was. But people like you abused her and forced her to change. He crosses into the bedroom, ripping off his shirt and changes into a brilliant silk bowling shirt. She follows him. Do you think you're going bowling now? Sure. You're not going bowling. She catches hold of his shirt. Why did you do this to her? I'd done nothing to no one. Let go of my shirt, you've torn it. I want to know why. Tell me why. When we first met, me and you, you thought I was common. And how right you was, baby. I was common as dirt. You showed me the snapshot of the place with the columns. I pulled you down off them columns and how you loved it, having them colored lights going. And wasn't we happy together? Wasn't it all okay till she showed here? Stella makes a slight movement. Her look goes suddenly inward as if some interior voice had called her name. She begins a slow shuffling progress from the bedroom to the kitchen, leaning and resting on the back of the chair and then off the edge of the table with a blind look and a listening expression. Stanley, finishing with his shirt, is unaware of her reaction. And we wasn't happy together? Wasn't it all okay? Till she showed here. Hoity toity describing me as an ape? He suddenly notices the change in Stella. Oh, hey. Well, what is it, Stella? He crosses to her. Take me to the hospital. He is outside with her now, supporting her with his arm, murmuring indistinguishably as they go outside. Scene nine. A while later that evening, Blanche is seated in a tense, hunched position in a bedroom chair that she has recovered with diagonal green and white stripes. She has on her scarlet satin robe. On the table beside chair is a bottle of liquor and a glass. The rapid, feverish polka tune, the Vars of Viana, is heard. The music is in her mind. She is drinking to escape it and the sense of disaster closing in on her. And she seems to whisper the words of the song. An electric fan is turning back and forth across her. Mitch comes around the corner in work clothes, blue denim shirt and pants. He is unshaven. He climbs the steps to the door and rings. Blanche is startled. Who is it, please? That's me, Mitch. The polka tune stops. Mitch, just a minute. She rushes about frantically, hiding the bottle in the closet, crouching at the mirror and dabbing her face with cologne and powder. She is so excited her breath is audible as she dashes about. At last, she rushes to the door in the kitchen and lets him in. Mitch, you know, I really shouldn't let you in after the treatment I've received from you this evening. So utterly uncavalier, but hello, beautiful. She offers him her lips. He ignores it and pushes her into the flat. She looks fearfully after him as he stalks into the bedroom. My, my, what a cold shoulder and such uncouth apparel. Why, you haven't even shaved. This is an unforgivable insult to a lady, but, but I forgive you. I forgive you because it is such a relief to see you. You, you stopped that polka tune that I had caught in my head. <laughs> Have you ever had anything caught in your head? Oh, no, of course you have not. You, you dumb angel puss. You never get anything awful stuck in your head. He stares at her while she follows him while she talks. It is obvious that he's had a few drinks on the way over. Do we have to have that fan on? Oh, no. I don't like fans. Well, then let's turn it off, honey. I I'm not partial to them. She presses the switch and the fan nods slowly off. She clears her throat uneasily as Mitch plumps himself down on the bed in the bedroom and lights a cigarette. I, I don't know what there is to drink. I, I haven't investigated. I don't want Stan's liquor. Well, it isn't Stan's. Everything here isn't Stan. Some of these things on the premises are actually mine. Oh, oh, how is your mother? Isn't your mother well? Why? Well, something's the matter tonight, but, but never mind. I won't cross-examine the witness. I'll, I'll just... She touches her forehead vaguely. The polka tune starts up again. Pretend not... I don't notice anything different about you. That... That music again. What music? The Barsylvania, <laughs> the polka tune they were playing when, when Alan, wait. A distant revolver shot is heard. Blanche seems relieved. There now, the shot, it always stops after that. 
The polka music dies out again. Yes. Now it's stopped. You boxed out of your mind? <laughs> I'll go and see what we could find in the way of... She crosses to the closet, pretending to search for the bottle. Oh, by the way, excuse me for not being dressed, but I'd practically given up on you. Had you forgotten your invitation to supper? I wasn't going to see you anymore. Wait a minute. I can't hear what you're saying. You talk so little that when you do say something, I don't want to miss a single syllable of it. And, and what am I looking for around here? Oh, yes, liquor. We've had so much excitement around here this evening that I, I am boxed out of my mind. She pretends suddenly to find the bottle. He draws his foot up on the bed and stares at her contemptuously. Oh, here's something. Southern comfort. What is that, I wonder? If you don't know, it must belong to Stan. Oh, take your foot off the bed. It has a light cover on it. But of course, you boys don't notice things like that. I've done so much with this place since I've been here. Bet you have. Well, you saw it before I came, and well, look at it now. This room is almost dainty, and I want to keep it that way. I wonder if this stuff ought to be mixed with something. Mmm, oh, it's sweet, so sweet. It's terribly, terribly sweet. Why, it's a liqueur, I believe. Yes, that's what it is, a liqueur. Mitch grunts. I'm afraid you won't like it, but, but try, maybe you will. I told you already, I don't want none of this liquor, and I mean it. You want to lay off his liquor. He says you've been lapping it up all summer like a wild cat. Oh, what a fantastic statement. Fantastic of him to say it and fantastic of you to repeat it. I will not descend to the level of such cheap accusations to answer them even. Huh. What's in your mind? I see something in your eyes. Mitch gets up. It's dark in here. I like it dark. The dark is comforting to me. I don't think I ever seen you in the light. Blanche laughs breathlessly. That's a fact. <laughs> is it? I've never seen you in the afternoon. Well, whose fault is that? You never want to go out in the afternoon. Why, Mitch, you're, you're at the plants in the afternoon. Not Sunday afternoon. I've asked you to go out with me sometimes on Sundays, but you always make an excuse. You never want to go out till after six, and, and it's always someplace it's not lighted much. There is some obscure, obscure meaning in this, but I fail to catch it. What it means is I've never had a real good look at you, Blanche. Let's turn the light on here. Light? Which light? What for? This one with the paper thing on it. He tears the paper lantern off the bulb. She utters a frightened gasp. <gasps> what did you do that for? So I can take a look at you good and plain. Of course, you don't really mean to be insulting. No, just realistic. I don't want realism. I want magic. <laughs> yes, yes, magic. I try to give that to people. I mis, I misrepresent, misrepresent things to them. I don't tell the truth. I tell what ought to be the truth. And if that's sinful, then let me be damned for it. Don't turn the light on. Mitch crosses to the switch. He turns the light on and stares at her. She cries out and covers her face. He turns the light off again. I don't mind you being older than, I, than what I thought, but all the rest of it? Christ, that pitch about your ideals being so old-fashioned, all that malarkey that you dished out all summer. Oh, I knew you weren't 16 anymore, but I was a fool to believe you were straight. Who told you I wasn't straight? My loving brother-in-law? And you believed him. I called him a liar at first, and then I checked on the store myself. First, I asked our supply man who travels through Laurel. Then I talked directly over long distance to this merchant. Who is this merchant? Keyfaber. The merchant Keyfaber of Laurel. I know the man. He whistled at me and I put him in his place. So now for revenge, he makes up stories about me. Three people, Keyfaber, Stanley and Shaw, swore to him. Oh, you rub a dub dub, three men in a tub and such a filthy tub. Didn't you stay at a hotel called the Flamingo? Flamingo? No, Tarantula was the name of it. I stayed at a hotel called the Tarantula Arms. Tarantula? Yes, a big spider. That's where I brought my victims. She pours herself another drink. Yes, I had many intimacies with strangers. 
after the death of Alan, intimacies with strangers was all I seemed capable of to fill my empty heart with. I think it was panic, just, just panic that drove me from one to another, hunting for some protection here and there, and then in, in the most unlikely of places, even at last in a 17-year-old boy. But somebody wrote the superintendent about it. This woman is not morally unfit for her position. She throws back her head with a convulsive, sobbing laughter, then repeats the statement, gasps and drinks. <laughs> oh, true. Yes. I, I suppose unfit somehow anyway. So I, I came here because there was nowhere else I could go. I was played out, but do you know what played out is? My youth suddenly gone up the water spout. And I, and I met you. You said you needed somebody. Well, well, I needed somebody too. And I thank God for you because you seem to be gentle, a cleft in the rock of the world that I could hide in. but. I guess I was asking, hoping too much. Keith Faber, Stanley and Shab tried, tied an old tin can to the tail of the kite. There is a pause. Mitch stares at her dumbly. You lied to me, Blanche. Oh, don't say I lied to you. Lies, lies inside and out, all lies. Never inside. I didn't lie in my heart. A vendor comes around the corner. She is a blind woman in a dark shawl, carrying bunches of those gaudy tin flowers that lower class folks display at funerals and other festive occasions. She is calling barely audibly. Her figure is only faintly visible outside the building. Flores, Flores, Flores para los muertos. Flores, Flores. What? Oh, somebody outside. She goes to the door, opens it, and stares at the street vendor woman. She is at the door and offers Blanche some of her flowers. Flores? Flores para los muertos? No, no, not now, not now. She darts back into the apartment, slamming the door. The street vendor woman turns away and starts to move down the street. Flores para los muertos. The polka tune fades in. Crumble and fade, and regrets, and recriminations. And if you'd done this, it wouldn't have cost me that. Corones para los metos, corones. Legacies, and, and other things such as, as blood-stained pillow slips, and, and her linens need changing. Oh, yes, mother, but, but wouldn't we get a servant girl to do that? Oh, oh no, of course, no, everything's gone, but the- Flores. Death. I used to sit here, and she used to sit over there, and death was as close as you are, and we didn't dare even admit we'd ever heard of it. Flores para los muertos. Flores. Flores. It's the opposite of the desire. So, so do you wonder? How could you possibly wonder? Not not far from Belle Reve. Before we had lost Belle Reve, there was a camp where they trained young soldiers. And on Saturday nights, they would they would go into town and get drunk. Corones. And on the way back, they would stagger onto my lawn and call Blanche, Blanche. And only the, the deaf old lady remained suspected nothing. But sometimes I slipped outside to answer their calls. And later, the paddy wagon would gather on them up like daisies. The long way home. The street vendor woman turns slowly and drifts back off with her soft, mournful cries. Blanche goes to the dresser and leans forward on it. After a moment, Mitch rises and follows her purposefully. The polka music fades away. He places his hands on her waist and tries to turn her about. What do you want? Mitch fumbles to embrace her. What I've been missing all summer. Then marry me, Mitch. I don't think I want to marry you anymore. No? Mitch drops his hands from her waist. You're not clean enough to bring in the house with my mother. Then go away then. He stares at her. Get out of here quick before I start screaming fire. Her throat is tightening with hysteria. Get out of here quick before I start screaming fire. He still remains staring. She suddenly rushes to the big window with its pale blue square of soft summer light and cries wildly. Fire! 
With a startled gasp, Mitch turns and goes out the outer door, clatters awkwardly down the steps and around the corner of the building. Blanche staggers back from the window and falls to her knees. The distant piano is slow and blue. Scene 10. It is a few hours later that night. Blanche has been drinking fairly steadily since Mitch left. She has dragged her wardrobe trunk into the center of the bedroom. It hangs open with flowery dresses thrown across it. As the drinking and packing went on, a mood of hysterical exhilaration came into her and she has decked herself out in a somewhat soiled and crumpled white satin evening gown and a pair of scuffed silver slippers with brilliant set in their heels. Now she's placing the rhinestone tiara on her head before the mirror of the dressing table and murmuring excitedly as if to a group of spectral admirers. Well, how about taking a swim? A moonlight swim at the old rocky quarry? Of anyone sober enough to drive a car? <laughs> oh, the best way in the world to stop your head buzzing. Only you've got to be careful to dive where the pool is deep. If you, if you hit a rock, you don't come up till tomorrow. <laughs> Tremblingly, she lifts the hand mirror for closer inspection. She catches her breath and slams the mirror down with such violence that the glass cracks. She moans a little and attempts to rise. Stanley appears around the corner of the building. He still has on the vivid green silk bowling shirt. As he rounds the corner, the honky-tonk music is heard. It continues softly throughout the scene. He enters the kitchen, slamming the door. As he peers in at Blanche, he gives a low whistle. He has had a few drinks on the way and has brought some quart beer bottles home with him. How's my sister? She's doing okay. How is the baby? Baby won't come before morning, so they told me to go home and get a little shut eye. Does that mean we ought to be alone in here? Yep. It's you and me, Blanche. Unless you have somebody hid under the bed. What do you got on those fine feathers for? Oh, that's right. You left before my wire came. You got a wire? I received a telegram from an old admirer of mine. Anything good? I think so. An invitation. What to? Fireman's ball? <laughs> a cruise of the Caribbean on a yacht. Oh, what do you know? I have never been so surprised in my life. I guess not. Came like a bolt from the blue. Who'd you say it was from? An old bow of mine. The one that gave you the white box pieces? Mr. Shep Huntley. I wore his ATO pin my last year at college. I hadn't seen him again until last Christmas. I, I ran into him on Biscayne Boulevard and, and then just now this wire invited me on a cruise of the Caribbean. <laughs> the problem is, is clothes. I, I tore into my trunk to see what I have that's suitable for the tropics. You come up with that gorgeous diamond tiara? Oh, oh, this old relic? <laughs> it's only rhinestones. Oh gosh, I thought it was Tiffany diamonds. He unbuttons his shirt. Well, anyhow, I shall be entertained in style. Mm-hmm. It goes to show, you never know what's coming. Just when I thought my luck had begun to fail me. Into the picture pops this Miami millionaire. This man is not from Miami. This man is from Dallas. Oh, this man's from Dallas? Yes, this man is from Dallas, but where gold spouts from out of the ground. Oh, just so he's from somewhere. He starts removing his shirt. Close the curtains before you undress any further. Well, this is all I'm going to undress right now. He rips the sack off a quart beer bottle. <sighs> See a bottle opener? She moves slowly towards the dresser where she stands with her hands knotted together. What a cousin you could open a beer bottle with his teeth. Pounding the bottle cap on the corner of the table. That was his only accomplishment. All he could do. He, he was just a human bottle opener. And then one time, at a wedding party, he broke his front teeth off. And after that, he was so ashamed of himself, he used to sneak out of the house and company came over. The bottle cap pops off and a geyser of foam shoots up. Stanley laughs happily, holding up the bottle over his head. Ha, rain from heaven. He extends the bottle towards her. Shall we bury the hatchet and make it a loving cup? Hmm? No, thank you. Oh, well, it's a red letter night for us both. You're having an oil millionaire and me having a baby. 
He goes to the bureau in the bedroom and crouches to remove something from the bottom drawer. What are you doing in there? Just something I always break out on special occasions like this. The silk pajamas I wore on my, my wedding night. Oh? When the telephone rings and they say, you got a son, I'll tear this off and wave it like a flag. He shakes out a brilliant pajama coat. I guess we're both entitled to put on the dog. He goes back to the kitchen with his coat over his arm. When I think of how divine it is going to be to have such a thing as privacy once more, I, well, I, could, I could weep with joy. Um, this millionaire from Dallas isn't going to interfere with your privacy any? Well, it won't be the sort of thing that you have in mind. This man is a gentleman and he respects me. <laughs> what, what he wants is my companionship. Having a, a great wealth sometimes makes people lonely. Uh, a cultivated woman, a woman of intelligence and breeding can enrich a man's life immeasurably. I have those things to offer and, and this doesn't take them away. Well, physical beauty is passing, a transitory possession, but, but beauty of the mind and richness of the spirit and tenderness of the heart. Oh, and I have all those things. They aren't taken away, but they grow. They increase with the years. How strange that I should be called a destitute woman when I have all these treasures locked in my heart. A choked sob comes from her. I think of myself as a, as a very, very rich woman, but I've been foolish casting my pearls before swine. Swine, huh? Yes, swine. And I'm thinking not only of you, but of your friend, Mr. Mitchell. He came to see me tonight. He dared to come here in his work clothes and repeat slander to me, the vicious stories that he had gotten from you. I gave him his walking papers. You did, huh? But then he come back. He returned with a box of roses to beg for my forgiveness. He implored my forgiveness, but, but some things are not forgivable. Deliberate cruelty is not forgivable. It is the one unforgivable thing in my opinion, and it is the one thing of which I have never, never been guilty. And I, I told him so, I said to him, thank you, but it was foolish of me to think that we could ever adapt ourselves to each other. Our ways of life are too different. Our attitudes and our backgrounds are incompatible. We, we have to be realistic about such things. So farewell, my friends, and let there be no hard feelings. Is this before or after the telegram came from the Texas oil millionaire? What telegram? Oh, no, no, after. As a matter of fact, the wire had As just a matter paid. of fact, there was no wire at all. Oh, oh. Oh, there isn't no millionaire. And Mitch didn't come back with roses because I know where he is. Oh. This isn't a goddamn thing but imagination. Oh. And lies and conceit and tricks. Oh. Look at yourself. Take a look at yourself in that worn out Mardi Gras outfit rented for 50 cents from some rag picker with the crazy crown on. What kind of queen do you think you are? Oh, God. I've been on to you from the start. Not once did you pull any wool over this boy's eyes. You come in here and sprinkle the place with powder and spray perfume and cover the light bulb with a paper lantern and lo and behold, the place has turned into Egypt and you are the queen of the Nile, sitting on your throne and swilling down my liquor. I say, <laughs> do you hear me? Do you hear me? <laughs> he walks into the bedroom. Don't come in here. Lurid reflections appear on the walls around Blanche. The shadows are of a grotesque and menacing form. She catches her breath, crosses to the phone, and jiggles the hook. Stanley goes into the bathroom and closes the door. Operator, operator, give me long distance, please. I want to get in touch with Mr. Shep Hutley of Dallas. He, he's so well known, he doesn't require any address. Just ask anybody. Oh, oh, wait, no, no, I can find it right now. Please understand. No, no, wait, one moment. Someone is, oh, nothing, hold on, please. She sets the phone down and crosses warily into the kitchen. The night is filled with inhuman voices like cries in a jungle. The shadows and lurid reflections move sinuously as flames along the wall spaces. Through the back wall of the rooms, which have become transparent, can be seen at the sidewalk. A prostitute has rolled a drunkard. He pursues her along the walk, overtakes her, and there is a struggle. A policeman's whistle breaks it up. The figures disappear. 
Some moments later, the neighborhood woman appears around the corner with a sequined bag, which the prostitute had dropped on the walk. She is rooting excitedly through it. Blanche presses her knuckles to her lips and slowly returns to the phone. She speaks in a hoarse whisper. Operator, operator, never mind long distance. Get Western Union. There isn't time to be Western Union. What Western Union? She waits anxiously. Western Union? Yes, I want to take down this message. In desperate, desperate circumstances, help me. Caught in a trap. I caught in a... Oh! The bathroom door is thrown open and Stanley comes out in the brilliant silk pajamas. He grins at her as he knots the tasseled sash about his waist. She gasps and backs away from the phone. He stares at her for a count of ten. Then a clicking becomes audible from the telephone, steady and rasping. He left the phone off the hook. He crosses to it deliberately and sets it back on the hook. After he has replaced it, he stares at her again, his mouth slowly curving into a grin as he weaves between Blanche and the outer door. The barely audible blue piano begins to drum up louder. The sound of it turns into a roar by turns into the roar of an approaching locomotive. Blanche crouches, pressing her fist to her ears until it has gone by. Let me get by you. Get by me, sure. Go ahead. He moves back a pace in the doorway. You, you stand over there. She indicates a further position. You got plenty of room to walk by me now. Not with you there, but, but, but I, I have to get out somehow. Think I'll interfere with you, huh? The blue piano goes softly. She turns confusedly and makes a faint gesture. The inhuman jungle voices rise up. He takes a step towards her, biting his tongue, which protrudes between his lips. But think of it. Maybe you wouldn't be bad to interfere with. Blanche moves backward through the door into the bedroom. Stay back. Don't you don't you come toward me another step or I'll What? Or something awful will happen. It will. Oh, what are you putting on now? They are both now inside the bedroom. I warn you, don't I'm in danger. He takes another step. She smashes a bottle on the table and faces him, clutching the broken top. Oh, what'd you do that for? So I could twist the broken end in your face. Oh, I bet you would do that. I would. I will if you... Oh, so you want some roughhouse? All right, let's have some roughhouse. He springs towards her, overturning the table. She cries out and strikes him with the bottle top, but he catches her wrist. Tiger, tiger, drop the bottle top. Drop it. We've had this date with each other from the beginning. She moans. The bottle top falls. She sinks to her knees. He picks up her inert figure and carries her to the bed. The hot trumpet and drums from the four deuces sound loudly. Scene 11. It is some weeks later. Stella is packing Blanche's things. Sounds of water can be heard running in the bathroom. The portiers are partly open on the poker players. Stanley, Steve, Mitch, and Paul who sit around the table in the kitchen. The atmosphere of the kitchen is now the same as the raw, lurid one of the disastrous poker night. The building is framed by the sky of turquoise. Stella has been crying as she arranges the flowery dresses in the open trunk. Eunice comes down the steps from her flat above and enters the kitchen. There is an outburst from the poker table. Drew to an inside street. I made it. My God. Put it in English, Greaseball. I'm cursing your rotten luck. Hmm. You know what luck is? Luck is believing you're lucky. Take it Salerno. I believed I was lucky. I figured that four out of five would not come through, but I would, and I did. I put that down as a rule. To hold front position in this rat race, you gotta believe you're lucky. You, 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 brag, brag, bull, bull. Stella goes into the bedroom and starts folding a dress. What's the matter with him? I always did say that men are callous things with no feelings, but this does beat anything, making pigs of yourselves. She comes through the portiers into the bedroom. What's the matter with her? Oh, is my baby. Sleeping like a little angel. Brought you some grapes. She puts them on the stool and lowers her voice. Blanche? Bathing. How is she? She wouldn't eat anything, but asked for a drink. What did you tell her? I just told her we'd made arrangements for her to rest in the country. 
She got it mixed in or got it mixed in her mind with Chef Huntley. Blanche opens the bathroom door slightly. Hello. Yes, Blanche. If anyone calls while I'm bathing, take a number and tell them I will call them right back. Yes. Oh, that that cool yellow silk, the the bushel. See if it's crushed. If if it's not too crushed, I'll, I'll wear it. And and on the lapel, that that silver and and turquoise pin on, in the shape of a seahorse. You'll find them in the heart shaped box I keep my accessories in. And, and Stella, try to locate a bunch of artificial violets to put in that box too to pin with the seahorse on the lapel of the jacket. She closes the door. Stella turns to Eunice. I don't know if I did the right thing. What else could you do? I couldn't believe her story and go on living with Stanley. Don't ever believe it. Life has got to go on. No matter what happens, you've got to keep on going. The bathroom door opens a little. Is the coast clear? Yes, Blanche. Tell her how well she's looking. Please close the curtains before I come out. They're closed. How many for you? Two. Three. Blanche appears in the amber light of the door. She has a tragic radiance in her red satin robe following the sculptural lines of her body. The Varsuviana rises audibly as Blanche enters the bedroom. I have just washed my hair. Did you? I'm not sure I got the soap out. Such fine hair. It's a problem. Oh, didn't I get a call? From who, Blanche? Shep Huntley. Why not? Not yet, honey. How strange. I... At the sound of Blanche's voice, Mitch's arm supporting his cards has sagged and his gaze is dissolved into space. Stanley slaps him on the shoulder. Hey, Mitch, come to. The sound of this new voice shocks Blanche. She makes a shocked gesture, forming his name with her lips. Stella nods and looks quickly away. Blanche stands quite still for some moments. The silverbacked mirror in her hands and a look of sorrowful perplexity as though all human experience shows on her face. Blanche finally speaks, but with sudden hysteria. What's going on here? She turns from Stella to Eunice and back to Stella. Her rising voice penetrates the concentration of the game. Mitch ducks his head lower, but Stanley shoves back his chair as if about to rise. Steve places a restraining hand on his arm. What's happened here? I want an explanation of what's happened here. Hush, 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 honey. Please, Blanche. Why are you looking at me like that? Is there something wrong with me? You look wonderful, Blanche. Doesn't she look wonderful? Yes. I understand you're going on a trip? Yes, Blanche is. She's going on a vacation. I'm green with envy. Help me, help me get dressed. Is this what you... Yes, yes, it'll do. I I'm anxious to get out of here. This place is a trap. What a pretty blue jacket. It's lilac colored. You're both mistaken. It's Delia Robia blue. The, the blue of the robe and the old Madonna pictures. Uh, are these grapes washed? She fingers the bunch of grapes which Eunice had brought in. Hmm? Washed, I said. Are, are they washed? They're from the French market. Well, that doesn't mean they've been washed. The cathedral bells chime. Oh, those cathedral bells. They're the only clean thing in the quarter. Well, I I'm going now. I'm, I'm ready to go. You're just going to walk out before they get here. Wait, Blanche. I don't want to pass in front of those men. Then wait till the game breaks up. Sit down and- Blanche turns weakly, hesitantly about. She lets them push her into a chair. I can smell the sea air. The rest of my time I'm gonna spend on the sea. And when I die, I'm gonna die on the sea. And, and you know what I shall die of? She plucks a grape. I shall die of eating an unwashed grape <laughs> one day out on the ocean. I will die with my hand in the hand of some nice looking ship's doctor. One very young one with small blonde mustache and a big silver watch. And poor lady, they'll say. The quinine did her no good. That unwashed grape has transported her soul to heaven. The cathedral chimes are heard. And I'll be buried at sea. I'll sewn up in a clean white sack and dropped overboard at noon in the blaze of summer and into an ocean 
as blue as chimes again my first lover's eyes a doctor and a matron have appeared around the corner of the building and climbed up the steps to the porch the gravity of their profession is exaggerated the unmistakable aura of the state institution with its clinical detachment the doctor rings the doorbell the murmur of the game is interrupted that must be done stella presses her fist to her lips what is it excuse me while i see who's at the door yes eunice goes into the kitchen i wonder if it's for me a whispered colloquy takes place at the door someone is calling for blanche it is for me then. She looks fearfully from one to the other, then to the portiers. The Varsiviana faintly plays. Is it the gentleman I was expecting from Dallas? I think it is, Blanche. Oh, I'm, I'm not quite ready. Ask him to wait outside. I. Eunice goes back to the portiers. Drums sound very softly. Everything packed? My, my silver toilet articles are still out. Ah, <clears throat> they're waiting in front of the house. They? Who's they? The Varsuviana is playing distantly. Stella stares back at Blanche. Eunice is holding Stella's arm. There is a moment of silence. No sound but that of Stanley steadily shuffling the cards. Blanche catches her breath again and slips back into the flat with a peculiar smile, her eyes wide and brilliant. As soon as her sister goes past her, Stella closes her eyes and clenches her hands. Eunice throws her arms comforting about her. Then she starts up to her flat. Blanche stops just inside the door. Mitch keeps staring down at his hands on the table, but the other men look at her curiously. At last, she starts around the table toward the bedroom. As she does, Stanley suddenly pushes back his chair and rises as if to block her way. The matron follows her into the flat. You forget something? Yes, yes, I've forgotten something. She rushes past him into the bedroom. Lurid reflections appear on the walls in odd, sinuous shapes. The Varsuviana is filtered into weird distortion, accompanied by the cries and noises of the jungle. Blanche seizes the back of a chair as if to defend herself. Doc, you better go in. Nurse, bring her out. The matron advances on one side, Stanley on the other. Divested of all the softer properties of womanhood, the matron is a peculiarly sinister figure in her severe dress. Her voice is bold and toneless as a fire bell. Well, Blanche. The greeting is echoed and re-echoed by other mysterious voices behind the walls as if reverberated through a canyon of rock. She says that she forgot something. The echo sounds in threatening whispers. That's all right. What'd you forget, Blanche? Hi. Hi. It don't matter. We can pick it up later. Sure. We can send it along with the truck. I don't know you. I don't know you. I want to be left alone, please. Now Blanche. The echo is rising and falling. Now Blanche, mm. now Blanche, Blanche. You left nothing here but spilt talcum and old empty perfume bottles. Unless it's the paper lantern you want to take with you. You want the lantern? He crosses to the dressing table and seizes the paper lantern, tearing it off the light bulb and extends it towards her. She cries out as if the lantern was herself. The matron steps boldly toward her. She screams and tries to break past the matron. All of the men spring to their feet. Stella runs out to the porch with Eunice following to comfort her, simultaneously with the confused voices of the men in the kitchen. Stella runs into Eunice's embrace on the porch. Oh my God, Eunice, help me. Don't let them do that to her. Don't let them hurt her. Oh God, please God, don't, don't hurt her. What are they, what are they doing to her? What are they doing? She tries to break from Eunice's arms. No, honey, no, no. Stay here. Don't go back in there. Stay with me and, and don't look. What have I done to my sister? Oh, God. What have I done to my sister? Done the right thing. The only thing you could do. She couldn't stay here. There was no other place for her to go. While Stella and Eunice are speaking on the porch, the voices of the men in the kitchen overlap. Mitch has started towards the bedroom. Stanley crosses to block him. Stanley pushes him aside. Mitch lunges and strikes at Stanley. Stanley pushes Mitch back. Mitch collapses at the table, sobbing. During the preceding scenes, the matron catches hold of Blanche's arm and prevents her flight. Blanche turns wildly and scratches at the matron. The heavy woman pinions her arms. Blanche cries out hoarsely and slips to her knees. These fingernails have to be trimmed. The doctor comes into the room and she looks at him. 
jacket, doctor? Not unless necessary. He takes off his coat and he now becomes personalized. The unhuman quality goes. His voice is gentle and reassuring as he crosses to Blanche and crouches in front of her. As he speaks her name, her terror subsides a little. The lurid reflections fade from the walls. The inhuman cries and noises die out and her own hoarse crying is calmed. Mr. Boyce? She turns her face to him and stares with desperate pleading. He smiles, then speaks to the matron. It won't be necessary. I'm gonna let go of me. Let go. The matron releases her. Blanche extends her hand towards the doctor. He draws her up gently and supports her with his arm and leads her through the portiers. Whoever you are, I have always depended on the kindness of strangers. The poker players stand back as Blanche and the doctor cross the kitchen to the front door. She allows him to lead her as if she were blind. They go out on the porch. Stella cries out her sister's name from where she is crouched a few steps up on the stairs. Blanche walks on without turning, followed by the doctor and the matron. They go around the corner of the building. Eunice descends to Stella and places the child in her arms. It is wrapped in a pale blue blanket. Stella accepts the child sobbingly. Eunice continues downstairs and enters the kitchen where the men, except for Stanley, are returning silently to their places about the table. Stanley has gone out on the porch and stands at the foot of the steps looking at Stella. Stella? She sobs with inhuman abandon. There is something luxurious in her complete surrender to her crying now that her sister is gone. No, honey. Now, love. Now, no, love. He kneels beside her and his fingers find the opening of her blouse. No, no, love. No. The luxurious sobbing, the sensual murmur fade away under the swelling music of the blue piano and the muted trumpet. This game is seven card stud. Yeah. Away from all the sounds of him. She waits for it to end. He's sick, deranged. She knows.